Ready? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. La hawla wa la qubbata illa billahi al-Ali al-Azim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad. Wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahiri. Uh, we've been talking about different ways in which a spiritual a struggle has been introduced. Sometimes it is introduced as a fight, as a battle, but against the internal enemy, which is our own self or our own soul. Sometimes it is introduced as a medicine. There are diseases and illnesses of the heart that we should try to remove. Sometimes it is introduced as a journey and you are a traveler. According to the Quran, everything is returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially about human beings. Sometimes Allah says everything is returning to him. For example, إِلَى اللَّهِ تُرْجَعُ الْأُمُورِ Sometimes it's about human beings. Or Allah says in chapter 84, verse 6. O man, you are trying hard to reach your Lord. And you will finally meet him. So every human being is going back to Allah and will meet Allah. There is a discussion here, what does it mean to return? Um, I have a conclusion here, but I don't mention this because this takes time. I have my understanding of what does it mean everything returns to Allah. It doesn't mean that they cease to ex exist. No, they will be existing, but still they will be returning. I don't discuss that now, but what I'm trying to say is that every human being is in a journey. It's not up to us whether we want to travel or not. We are all to go back to Allah. This is not decided by us. But we can decide how we want to return. <coughs> Do we want to return one and three? Do we want to return while we have prepared ourselves? Or we want to be forced? If you are forced to return, you never become ready for that. But if you love to return and prepare yourself, for you the most joyful thing would be to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> Imagine if we have exam and I have studied very well. Even, you know, sometimes I have studied during night, during holidays. I have done my best to get ready for exam. On the day of exam, when I meet my teacher and, you know, when I receive, uh, take the exam questions, I am very happy because I know all my efforts now bear fruit. And I want to show what I have studied, what I have learned. I know that the merits that I have compared to the people who didn't study will appear today. But those who were lazy, those who didn't study, those who were just, you know, wasting their time, they're just playing. The day of exam is very difficult for them. And when they get the result, it's even more <coughs> difficult. Yeah, the worst with them, they get the result. You know, Allah says in the Quran that, أَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ فَيَقُولُ هَا أُمُقْرَأُ كِتَابِيَ إِنِّي ذَنَنْتُ إِنِّي مُلَاغٍ حِسَابِيَ He says, Come and see and read my book. I was confident, I was sure that I'm going to be judged and to be responsible for what I have done, accountable. So they want everyone to come and see the result. 
Yeah. Book of Deeds. But those who were not prepared, they want to hide from people. But unfortunately, there is no way to hide. You are full Muslim. You can see the criminals by looking at the face. That book which is given to the right hand or the left hand is one way of understanding the result. Otherwise, you don't need to read that. The whole person is clear whether he was a person who has failed or a person who... You know, like, for example, a person who is full of light, a person who is in darkness. Yeah, you don't need to say, let me look at what is written there. The whole personality shows what type of person is this. So the Quran talks about two situations when people meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wujuhun yawma izan musfarah zahikatun mustabshara. There are people, their face is open, they smile, they are very happy. But there are people that they are dust and alayha ghabara. Wujuhun yawma izan alayha ghabara. Tarhaquha qatara. Or for example, وُجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذًا نَاظِرَةٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةٌ They are very happy and they look at Allah's face. Of course, not physical, you know, face. <coughs> but those who are criminal, they are sad and they don't look at Allah. They, you know, try to bend their neck, you know, so that they don't see Allah and Allah doesn't look at them eye to eye. Of course, it's not physical, it's kind of analogy. So, we all meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of this journey. But depending on how we have traveled, okay, our situation will be different. So, the whole process is compared to a journey. A spirituality as a journey. Those who want to embark on this journey, prepare themselves, they go through stations. And this is why we have books which talks about stations or manazil. Like for example, manazil or sa'irin. Stations of the wayfarers <coughs> by Khaja Abdullah Ansari. And there are others, you know, Osaf al-Ashraf by Khaja Nasir Tusi. They talk about different stations that you go through. What is important is you should never forget that you are traveling. What is the worst thing for a passenger? The worst thing for a passenger is to forget that he's a passenger. Imagine, you know, you have a connection flight and you arrive in the airport, then you forget that you, <laughs> you have to travel. And start shopping, okay? Then you miss the flight. Or you buy many things, but you cannot take with you. You have to leave them. Because there is limited thing that you can carry with you. If you forget that you are a traveler, you don't prepare yourself, and you invest on the things that would not be useful. Imagine, you know, if someone goes to for example, Mena or Arafat, <coughs> and forgets what he, why he's there. And says, you know, let me buy a piece of land here, you know, I make a nice house here for myself, you know, my children, you know, I make a garden here. You are here just for a few hours. There is no point in, you know, thinking, planning, working hard to do something here, you know, as a place of residence. Imagine, you know, for example, you have gone for a study somewhere. And if you forget, for example, I go home for a study, then I forget that I am there a few years for a study. I say, let me start a business here. Let me, you know, buy some property, you know, sell them, make money. You are there just for a study, not for making, you know, money. <coughs> not for, you know, thinking that you are there permanently. So, this is a journey that you have to remember that you are 
in, you have embarked on this journey and you have to prepare yourself for the higher stations to upgrade yourself. You know, if someone goes to primary school and forgets that this is a process and then he has to go to the secondary school, to the higher school, to university, if he forgets all that and says, this primary school is a very good place, and in a good playground, everything, let me be here for the end of my life, then it's not going to work. So, in Quran and in Hadith, we have been given different analogies, different models, different you know, paradigms, in order to understand that we should do something seriously for improving our relation with Allah, for you know, upgrading ourselves, for purifying ourselves. These are some major models. There are also other models. For example, also sometimes Quran talks about busyness or purchase. For example, Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اشْتَرَى مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah buys from mu'mineen their amwal, their anfos, you know, money, soul. بِأَنَّ لَهُمُ الْجَنَّةِ وَلْ وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي نَفْسَهُ بْتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ Or, قُلْ هَلْ أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَى تِجَارَةً تُنْجِيكُمْ مِنْ عَلَىٰ So, sometimes it's also mentioned as a kind of selling and buying. It's a market. You have to be clever. Don't sell your good cheap. Especially if it is the only thing that you have. You, have. you are selling your life. You are selling your soul. You are selling your youth. You shouldn't sell it cheap. If you sell it for anything worldly, it's selling it cheap. Sometimes people think <coughs> to sell cheap means that you have to increase the rate in worldly measures. No. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in the Quran, لا تشتروا بآياتي ثمنا قليلا. Don't buy with my verses little price. No. It means don't sell them with little price. One of the reciters of the Quran, famous one, once was invited, and he asked, or they told him, you know, we give you also this gift, this money. He said, this is too little. I need, for example, <coughs> 10 times more. They said, why are you asking too much? He said, Allah says, La tashtaru ba ayati samanan qalil. I am reciting for you Quran. I, the price is high. So you should give me more. Okay, this is good as a joke. But as a reality, it's not a reality. Why? Because when Allah says, don't sell my verses cheap, it doesn't mean that instead of taking $100, take $10,000. It means that don't take anything worldly for teaching or reciting Quran. Yeah? Because anything worldly is Ghalil. The whole dunya is Ghalil, Mata'un Ghalil. Okay? So, we have to remember that in this transaction, in this purchase, in this shira, we only get something which is valuable, which is akhirah, which is closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, this is another model which is mentioned in Quran and Hadith. And anyway, we have different ways, different explanations, lots of alhamdulillah ideas, all to make us think seriously about this issue. Now, I want to discuss about a quick review of the process that we should go through for this purification. Whether you want to say process of treatment, whether you want to say process of journey, process of, I don't know, internal fight, we need to have a framework. Many years ago, uh, I was thinking of talking about Islamic spirituality to non-Muslims. You know, we had Catholic Shia dialogue and one of the things I <coughs> was supposed to present was a spiritual direction in Islam. 
So at that time, I came up with this plan. Then I mentioned this in other places and wrote about this. So there is also a paper, inshallah, I will send you the link. A glance at the process of self-development. A glance at the process of self-development. I have tried to give a very brief framework because if you want to go to details, there are many, many things and even scholars don't agree. Some people say there are 50 stations, some people say there are 100 stations, some say there are 500 stations, you know. So they don't agree on the number and on which one is the first, which one is the second, which one is the third. Some of them they differ, some of them they may agree. But what I want to say, I think, is something that everyone can agree, because it's very basic. But at the same time, it's good to have a clear idea. The first thing, the first, you can say, a station, and some people say it is indeed a station zero, because they say journey starts after this. Some say this is a station one. Anyway, the first thing is what they call yakva. Yaqva means wakefulness. Yaqva means wakefulness, yeah? Estaiqadha means wake, he woke up. Uh, in Munajat uh, Sha'baniya we say, Allahi lam yakun li hawlun fa'antaqila bihi an ma'asiyatik illa fi waqtan ayqadtani la mahabbatik. I didn't have any power Opposite to Ghafla. Opposite to Ghafla. Yeah. Opposite to Ghafla, opposite to sleeping. So, we say to Allah, I didn't have any power to go away from sin except when you awoke me with your love. When I woke up with your love, then I was alert and I didn't commit sin. So, our problem is that we are not always alert. We are many times heedless. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Annas <coughs> niyamun People are asleep. Fa'idha matu Entabahu. When they die, they become alert. If you want to connect, you say Fa'idha ma tun tabahu. But it is two words. Ma tu entabahu. When you connect, you do vasil is Fa'idha ma tun tabahu. So annasun niyamun fa'idha ma tun tabahu. People are asleep. When they die, they wake up. But it's too late. If you wake up after you die, what can you do? Like, you know, I wake up and I see that I have missed a flight. I have missed the exam. It's better not to wake up. <laughs> if you are going to understand that you have missed, it's better not to wake up and remain. And this is why, you know, some people wish that they were never resurrected. Ya laitani kuntu turab. If I was buried in the soil, or even if I was soil, it was better than being resurrected from the soil and being alive and having no answer because I was not ready. So, ulama say the first thing that we have to do is to wake up. Kafla, or being heedless, negligent, is very bad. You know, we become very vulnerable when we are heedless. If you have the strongest fighter, when he's asleep, even a child can kill him. Yeah? Imagine you have the strongest, I don't know, wrestler in the world or anything you can imagine. When he's asleep, or when he's, for example, busy with something, for example, he's talking to someone, then someone uses his uh, lack of attention and can attack him and kill him. 
when we are heedless, shaitan and nafs ammare can easily attack and defeat us. We have to wake up. How do we wake up? You know, in the physical uh, sleep, you see some people wake up very quickly, and some people you have to, you know, call them a few minutes to wake them up. And some people, you know, their sleeping is very heavy, we say, you know, sanguine, you know, it's very heavy. So you cannot wake up. Sometimes you have to move them, you know, sometimes you have to put water, you know. Some people are like this, they don't wake up. In the spiritual life is also the same. Some people wake up very quickly. Some people, it takes them ages to wake up. Some people only wake up when they are dying. You know, there are people all their life, they are not religious. When they become old or, you know, when, for example, they see that, you know, they are ill and soon they are going dying, they become old. Some people wake up when they see someone in the family, you know, has died. You know, I mean, you might have seen people who are not religious, but when the father or mother dies, they become religious. Or when a child dies, the parents become religious. Sometimes poverty, sometimes, I don't know, catastrophes. <coughs> sometimes when people leave us. For example, if I have everyone respecting me, I forget Allah. But when I see my family, my friends, everyone, you know, abandons me, then I go back to Allah. So, people can wake up in different times. But we shouldn't delay this process. We should to, we try to wake up quickly. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Alam ya'ni lilladheena amanu an takhsha'a qulubuhum. Has not the time come for the believers that their heart becomes soft, humble for the remembrance of Allah? You know the story of Ayaz, uh, and you know there are many stories like this. There were people who were doing lots of mischief all their life. All of a sudden, one incident changed them. Once, for example, a person was reciting the Qur'an in the middle of the night and this person was on the wall and cha uh, this, uh, changed his life. The story of Bishra Hafi, as you, I said. So sometimes people need a revolution, a conversion, a change, a transformation. And this can happen when someone says something, when someone does something to them, when an incident happens. But a mu'min should not wait for that. We should think seriously about our life and be alert. <coughs> you know, when you are driving and you are, you are speaking, you know, uh, with mobile, you know, and uh, very much, you know, get into the discussion, then you forget that you are driving. You may have accident. Sometimes police stops you and says, you are driving and you are speaking and driving, it doesn't work. But we don't need to wait till police comes and stops us. We don't need to wait till we have an accident say, oh, I shouldn't have done this. We should be teaching ourselves. We should be awakening ourselves. So the first step is wakefulness and we should try to be awakened and one of the things that helps is thinking about our death zekrul mot remembrance of death is very important because uh, it's impossible to remember death and then you enjoy doing useless things. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam said, عَجِبْتُ لِمَنْ أَيْقَنَ بِالْمَوْتِ كَيْفَ يَفْرَحْ And I think this is also in Torah, uh, according to Hadith. 
عجبت لمن أيقن بالموت كيف يفرح I am astonished that someone who is certain that he's going to die how can he ever be happy if you really know that you are going to die you don't become happy not happy in a good sense means happy in the sense that you forget you just enjoy yourself and forget serious issues happiness which is against seriousness because sometimes you are happy and serious that's not bad but happy in the sense of forgetting serious issues and, uh, there is hadith from Imam Ali alayhi salam inna al-layla wa nahar ya'malan fiq fa'mal fihim day and night work constantly to affect you every day you are changed at least you are losing part of your capital every night is affecting you try you also affect them you also gain something from them if they are taking something away from you you also try to add to your capital yeah if I have to spend few days in a place I have to gain enough that from that place that would compensate otherwise I have lost because the best thing we have is our life this is our capital a businessman would not be happy to see that his capital is lost or even it is fixed if you have a shop and you don't make any money it's not good and if you lose it's worse we have to always gain more than what we lose so so we should always be in increase not in loss thinking about death thinking about limited time thinking about illnesses reading the life of pious people reflecting on the also life of bad people how they suffered despite having even worldly you know treasures these are the things can help us to wake up especially if you are encountered with good people with good many good examples you will be encouraged by looking at them you will be reminded by them so the first thing is to wake up the second is to know yourself nafs. do you know yourself I don't think many of us know ourselves but by knowing ourselves we don't mean what is my name what is my date of birth what is you know my I don't know nationality no these are things that are not important these are the things that even a person can know about us even a machine can register about us knowing ourselves means knowing what great world Allah has built inside us how much of talents we have how much of potentiality we have Allah says nafakhtu fihim in ruhi I have blown into Adam my spirit our spirit is Allah's spirit it is sanctuary of Allah our heart is sanctuary of Allah we can go even higher than angels there is no limit for our perfection no person would reach the point that Allah says okay now you have finished you cannot come closer angels have fixed position 
There is none of us except they have a fixed position, a known position. But human beings can go higher and higher. There is no limit. In any way, there is no limit. For example, Allah doesn't say, for you only to this extent. Or for example, Allah doesn't say, we have a quota. Only 100 people can be good. Only 1 million people can be good. Only 50% can be good. If all people of the world want to be good, there is no limit. If they all want to become Salman and Abu Zar, there is no problem. There is no restriction. There is no limit. So, we have to know all these things about ourselves, our potentials, our talents, our capacity, our personal also issues, what weaknesses I have, what problems I have, <coughs> what are the areas in which I am weak, I have to improve myself, or what are the good points that I have to preserve them, to be thankful for them, to try to strengthen them. Ma'rifatul nafs is very important. Uh, I don't know if you have seen the uh, book Self Knowledge. So I have mentioned hadith from Prophet and Imams about the significance of self knowledge, what we can achieve through self knowledge, what does it mean. So this is the book that you can use, and also there are other books, but mostly in Farsi, but this is in English, self-knowledge. For example, every Muslim scholar, you know, Sunni, Shia, they all have narrated. Prophet said, Man arafa nafsah, arafa rabbah, or faqad arafa rabbah. Whoever knows himself or herself, knows his Lord. It means that ma'rifatun nafs leads to ma'rifatun rabb. Knowing yourself and knowing Allah are two sides of the same coin. No one can know himself and not know Allah. Because if you know yourself, you realize that you are dependent on Allah. You are servant of Allah. You are vicegerent of Allah. On the other hand, if you don't know Allah, it means that you don't know yourself. So those who are not believers in God, they haven't understood the greatness of human beings. Forgetting Allah leads to forgetting yourself. This is La takunu kalladina nasullah fa'ansahum and fusam. Do not be like those who forgot Allah, then Allah made them forget themselves. You can forget yourself. What does it mean to forget yourself? You don't know who you are. You don't know what is the purpose of your life. You don't know what you have to do. You don't know what are your strong points and what are your weak points. So, ma'rifatun nafs is the second thing. The first, to wake up, to become alert. The second, after you wake up, try to know yourself. When you know yourself, you have to be careful that don't be distracted by seeing problems in people. Unfortunately, sometimes, as soon as we become spiritually sensitive, as soon as we start understanding, you know, things about spirituality and, and we learn these things, we start finding problems in people. For example, I say we should be honest. It's very important to be honest. Then I try to find out who is not honest. That was not the point. The point was to see whether you are honest or not. But I try to see who is dishonest. 
There is a hadith which says from Prophet Muhammad Tuba Leman Shagadahu Aibuh and Oyube Gaire. Blessed is the one who is busy thinking about his own deficiencies that he has no time to think about the deficiencies of others. You, you know when you go to Hajj for Tawaf, you are so much busy with your own Tawaf, you never think that, the, 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 for example, the person next to me he has, you know, for example, done seven or six or eight. I don't have time to think about anyone else. I am very focused on my own tawaf. <coughs> yeah? Our life is all like that. We have to be focused on our own life. When you are taking exam, you should not think about what answer the person next to me has given to the exam. It's not relevant to you. You have to be concerned about the way you are answering. <coughs> so this is a big problem that we become sensitive to finding out the problems of people. I am not saying you should close your eye and understand nothing about people. What I'm saying, control yourself. Don't go after people's problems. Don't try to find out. Sometimes it comes to your notice, but it shouldn't be something that you plan for. You shouldn't become, you know, uh, curious about people. And even if you come to know about the problem, you should always say, I have more, myself more problems. If you know there is a little, for example, clay <coughs> on someone's face, we quickly see but maybe something bigger is on my face and I cannot see. So a person who is clever always tries to look at mirror to see himself. Doesn't make himself busy with seeing people. Okay? So we have to remember that in the process of evaluation or self you know, assessment, don't be distracted by seeing problems of other people. You must have heard this story from me because this is one of my favorite stories about those four people that they had appointment with the king and they wanted to see the king, but because they didn't want to delay, they started saying their salat before making sure that it's the time of Salat. So when they were in the middle of Salat, they saw the Muazzin, who called for prayer, coming. So one of them, when he saw the Muazzin, he started doubting. So he said to the Muazzin, hasn't the time of Salat come? He was saying Salat. So in the Salat, he spoke. And Muazzin said, uh, so, sorry, uh, before Muazzin say anything, the person next to him said, why did you speak? Whether Salat has come or not, the time of Salat has come, by speaking you have made your Salat wait. Then the third person told the second person, you too spoke. If he spoke, he made a problem, but why you spoke to him? So he made the same mistake. The fourth person said, I don't speak to anyone. I want to be <laughs> concentrating on Again, he spoke. So this is the problem. We repeat mistakes of other people, but we don't see. I only see the problems in other people. Sometimes, you know, I hear, for example, 
there is a bad, I don't know, husband. And, you know, I hear about that bad qualities that that person has. But maybe I forget. I may have the same problems. And sometimes we really don't understand, you know, because it needs investigation, it needs examination. Because we so much love ourselves that we cannot understand that we have problems. Yeah? It's difficult to see your problems. With the physical problems, it's easier. If I look at mirror and see something is wrong in my dress or in my, you know, my hair or whatever, I can see. But with the a spiritual problem, it's very difficult to accept that I have problem. So, we have to be focused on our problems. After wakefulness and self-knowledge, what should be the next step? The next step is now to care for yourself, to look after yourself, to treat yourself. Because you want to improve, you don't want just to know. Okay, I know that I have these problems. It's not enough. Or I know that I have these talents. Just to know it's not enough. I have to benefit from this knowledge in order to improve myself, to develop myself, to build myself. Here we have to work in three areas. When we want to improve ourselves, we have to work in three areas. I am giving you a framework so that everything else you can put in this framework. The first area that we have to work is our beliefs. We are not robots. We are not machines. For a machine, what is important is what the machine does. It's not important what machine thinks. Yeah? You have a machine that makes tea for you. That's it. But when a human being brings you a tea, it's very important. What is the intention of this person? Why is bringing me tea? Does he or she bring me tea while he's hating me or she's hating me or she's loving me? Yeah? What is the intention? Someone gives me a gift. What is the intention? Is a sign of love, is a sign of mercy, or he's bribing me? Yeah? We are not machines. So, the beliefs are very important. When two people who look the same, or maybe the one who has no faith, maybe looks more beautiful, but he can never be compared to the one who has faith. Because faith, beliefs, are the most important thing for human beings. Okay? If there are two people, one is a believer, one is not a believer. The one who is not a believer, it's okay. I'm not saying that, you know, those who are not believers, you know, for example, have no respect. No. They have respect. As Amir al-Mu'minin said, Nadirun laka fil khalq. They are our fellow human beings. So, still we respect them. Still we try to have good relation. But I'm saying that the one who on top of humanity shares the same beliefs with us is much more closer. The one who believes in God, whether he's a Muslim or Christian or Jew, this faith in God is very important. It means this person has made a very big success. Imagine someone who doesn't believe in God how much you have to try hard to convince him to believe in God? This person already believes in God. Then if a person believes in God and believes in Islam, he's a Sunni. Okay, but Alhamdulillah, at least he believes in God and Islam. You know how difficult it is to bring a person to this station? If someone believes in God, believes in Islam, believes in a school of Ahlul Bayt, so it means that this person is 90% there. Maybe we have some differences. 
Unfortunately, sometimes we don't appreciate these commonalities and we only see the differences. So, two Shia, just because, for example, their marja is different, or I don't know, because their local imam is different, or, you know, they boycott each other. Why? This is 1% compared to 99% that you share. In any case, beliefs are very important. On the Day of Judgment, some ulama say, like Imam Khomeini in Chal Hadith, you know, in 40 Hadith, Arba'in, he says, on the Day of Judgment, what people see as punishment for their beliefs is much more severe than what they see for their actions. When a person has no belief in God, this is more severe than bad action. So, beliefs are very important. And this is why we have to always work on improving our aqaid, understanding of aqaid. Aqaid is not something that you learn you know, in madrasa and then say, okay, in madrasa I had you know, all usul al-din, that's enough. You should always improve your aqaid. And Aqaid is such a comprehensive area that never finishes. And you can always also go wider and deeper. Especially to understand your relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is very important. So one part of our progress comes through Aqaid. So in, when we talk about Islamic plan for life, Part of this plan can only be implemented if you have proper belief system. Okay? The second thing is we should have proper qualities, proper attributes, prop, prop, uh, <coughs> proper sefat characteristics, traits of character. <coughs> Are Qualities are very important. Am I a selfish person or selfless person? Am I a brave person or fearful person? It's not only a matter of actions. As a quality, as a permanent quality of the soul, heart. These are very important. For example, if someone is arrogant, this is a big problem. Allah says in the Quran, The next world, the hereafter, is for the people who don't want to be higher. And they don't want to do mischief. Means they are not arrogant. If I want to be served by people, if I want to be above people in the worldly meaning, it means that I have a big problem. Yes, in relation with Allah, it's good to try to be the closest person. But when it comes to dunya, if you want to be served by people or to be the highest person position, that's a problem. Am I an honest person or not? Am I a generous person or not? Am I a kind person or not? Am I a trustworthy person or not? This is the area that we should, inshallah, continue in this course. About Aqa'id, alhamdulillah, we had the first course. And inshallah, of course, we should keep working on that. About Akhlaq, we are going to talk more. I am setting up the ground, but we will talk about this this akhlaq, inshallah, in more details. These are very, very important. And the third thing is actions, behavior. Unfortunately, in the 20th century, 
some psychologists, they try to give all the significance only to behavior. You know, there's a whole school in psychology that they only say that we should study human behavior as if there is nothing like soul, there is nothing like a spirit. They only see the actions, the behavior. We say behavior is very important. Actions are very important. But what is more important is the soul, the heart, the character from which these actions come. Okay? It's like, for example, if a person, for example, you know, imagine there is an alien who speaks. These words come from his brain or from his mind. These words are never equal to his brain or mind. These are just some of the fruits, some of the results. What is more important is death. Or if he's a criminal person. On the other side, if there's a criminal person, maybe his criminal actions are even 1% of his criminal ideas there. So you should not only be concerned with what people do, you should be concerned with what people are. Yeah? <coughs> we pay attention to actions but we should pay more attention to the qualities. Okay, <clears throat> with respect to actions, what we need to do is, we should follow the guidelines given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his sharia, in his religion. First of all, not to do any haram. Not to do any haram. We shouldn't do any haram when it comes to action. Second, we should do all wajibat. Third, we should try to avoid things which are not haram but are disliked, discouraged, makru, as much as possible. You know, if your father or mother says to you that if you do this, I don't for example, you know, fight you, I don't, you know, punish you, but I don't like this. So you never do that in the presence of them. Yeah? For example, your mother says, you know, I don't like you to have this stress. It's not something I'm going to punish you or I'm going to stop talking to you, but whenever I see you with this stress, I am unhappy. So what do you do? At least in his presence or her presence, you don't put on this stress. Okay. Allah is present everywhere. So in His presence, we shouldn't do something that He dislikes. Okay? Especially knowing that when He dislikes something, it has no personal reason. It's for, because of us. He says, you know, for example, your father says, I am a doctor, and I tell you that this food or this dress is not good for you. I'm not going to punish you, but I don't like this. Because I know it's harming you. You don't do it. So, a woman tries to avoid even makruhat. The things which are disliked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And instead do mustahabbat. The things which are encouraged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we have mubahat. Means the things that you can do. There is no harm, but there is no benefit. If we really use our time in the good way, we shouldn't have time that much to do mubahat. Yeah? Because how much time you have? Very limited time. So you have to do always something which is useful. I am not saying we don't need to sleep, we don't need to eat, we don't need to drink. No, I'm saying that even these things, you can make them mustaha or wajib even. 
I can say I sleep because I want to gain energy to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then it's not mubah. It's either mustahab or wajib, depending whether it's necessary or it's helpful. So a mu'min can plan his actions in the way that in the end of the day he doesn't do anything unless it is wajib or mustahab. Yeah? <coughs> but at least we should do wajibat and avoid haram. This is the meaning. So this is something that I think we can learn it very quickly. By spending few hours, every person can learn general masail, general rulings, and then by keeping studying, he can understand the different areas that they may face. For example, if I'm going to do business, if I'm going to do farming, if I'm going to do banking, I can learn these things gradually. But those things which every person has to learn is not taking that much time. And this is something that we should learn it quickly and we should implement it quickly. Aqaid takes long time. Akhlaq takes long time. But for Ahkam, you should do it quickly. I cannot say, that, okay, I learned Masail of, for example, Salat and fasting and Khums in a few years. No, you have to learn them quickly because you have to practice them. It's a matter of urgency. But don't forget aqa'id and akhlaq and just be busy with ahkam. Ahkam is something which is the bottom line, which is the basis. We learn it quickly because we want to implement it from day one. But what remains with us is a long life process of self-purification. Of looking after our past, our piety. Here also, I have mentioned another point, which, uh, inshallah, we will discuss it later, and that is not to be satisfied with the, whatever you have achieved. You have to always go higher. إِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَنْسَ Allah says in the Quran, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَنْسَ When you finish or complete something, start again. You never no, stop, never get stuck, never be satisfied with what you have done. First of all, even the people who are very, very successful, they are never thinking that they are successful. They are never thinking that they are okay. Even awliyaullah, okay? They never think that they are awliyaullah. Awliyaullah, the friends of Allah, they are always worried. But even if you are awliyaullah, you can always improve. You can become better and better. So, the final point in this section is that you should continue this journey and try always to become better and better. Never be pleased with whatever you are. In worldly matters, to be pleased with whatever you are, to, to be content, to be qana'ah, yeah, to be content is okay, is good, in worldly things. But when it comes to knowledge, you should not be content. But when it comes to akhlaq, you should not be content with what you have. <coughs> you have to become always better and better. Now we can have a break and then inshallah <coughs> we will continue. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alamin.